Okay, so it's the Merlai Gays meeting on Tuesday, 14th of May. We got apologies from Chris and Laura, um, who are busy with something else. Laura did send in an update, which we can get to in a little bit, about crystallography efforts at Diamond. Um, but uh, the issue is already up on GitHub for the May 2024 meeting. Um, and I think that the main item of business was the deck that you sent through, Adrian. Um, if you would be happy to run through that, that would be fantastic. Certainly. So I'll share my screen. Yeah, that would be great. So this is in three bits. Um, the first really is um, the evaluation of the pyrozolipyrimidines that um, Yuhang has been sending through. So all the ones that we received this year. Um, the second is the um, IC50 work uh, with respect to the, uh, what were the atomized compounds. Uh, where basically we're finishing up with MERS-C, um, progressing to MERS-F. Um, and finally, just a side-by-side -side comparison for all the MER ligases challenged with the atomized compounds um, to see basically if, <clears throat> if we're being told anything by the data. So... Great. Are you able to go full screen just... Um, yes, I am. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's better. All right. So um, I always basically put in the assay details of, of what we do. Basically, um, this is a description of a Mercy assay, but it's applicable to, to the other ligases. It describes the phosphate release assay um, and the conditions that we use uh, for that. Um, it basically describes a fluorescent assay and describes how we actually analyze the data at the end. Uh, we use a, a four parameter model, which estimates IC50 and hill coefficient, amongst other things. And where we have data, which suggests we have inhibitors that bind tightly, uh, we use a Morrison equation to extract a KI uh, from the data. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So Yuhang sent through um, four additional pyrolopyrimidines, pyrolopyrimidines. Um, these were special because they were free amines, um, and therefore they had to basically be done rapidly. Um, they were there because the positive charge was supposedly there to try and enhance permeability <clears throat> through a gram-negative cell wall. Uh, consistent with literature. Um, the microbiology has been done. Uh, I don't know yet what the data say, but, but it should be coming your way. Um, so we basically just did the IC50 work uh, against Eudemonis originosa mercy. And uh, the structures are in the top row. The, sec the middle row are basically the um, IC50 data inhibition against compound concentration. Um, the inset in each of the uh, these panels is basically the log of the data, simply so you can see the beginning of the relationships because everything is crowded at the ones. And the bottom row are the conversion of the IC50 data uh, to a Morrison plot to extract um, the Ki of uh, the binding of the molecule on the basis that it's ATP competitive. So <clears throat> essentially, with respect to what we've seen before, these compounds are a lot less potent. So if I go to the next slide, um, essentially, um, the first six compounds we we sent through, the, the very, very worst of them had an IC50 of about just under five micromolar. Um, the compounds we've received, thus the second set of compounds, the amines, go all the way up to around about 23 micromolar. 
in terms of IC50, and that's reflected in the actual KI that you will calculate with the, the data. And, oops, sorry, slightly obscured by all of us, I'm afraid. Hang on, there we go. Um, basically, if you look at uh, KI values with regard going across the um, compound series, it's fairly evident that these last four, um, in general, are bind far more weakly than um, their predecessors. Um, whether that is because um, that amine has now a positive charge or whether it's missing something on that part of the molecule required for binding, I don't know. We need a crystal structure, but then you could say that about an awful lot of what we do. Just quickly um, on that, so the, the alignment of the data um, yeah. between IC50 and the KI, is that is that supporting the idea that these compounds are ATP competitive? Because they, um, they, the rank order is the same. Yeah, it doesn't support, it doesn't necessarily support the fact they're ATP competitive. In actual fact, what I need to do for this and a lot of the other work is actually go and start looking at different substrate concentrations and look at the impact on IC50s. Um, and uh, that, that should tell me. Um, the assumption of um, ATP competitiveness is basically based upon the fact that virtually everything else we do or have done is based upon the premise that you want to multi target an ATP binding site. Um, to be absolutely hand on heart about this, I can't necessarily say that these things are ATP competitive. Um, we've got the data from the Joe Iman's paper, where the modelling suggested they are. Um, but apart from that, uh, it really requires an experiment on my part to tease that out. Okay. It's great, though, that you are um, doing the sorry the, the microbiology has been done because again just to circle back to the reason for these compounds we, we were trying to show that these changes would help with accumulation and we can't do that with the compounds are really not potent um yeah. but that guy there um well one of the amines like um 76 yeah 76 one p is four four or well, five micromolar I mean, if if that generates a measurable response in the microbiology, then there's a little bit of evidence there. But it's still difficult, you know, to yeah. because we're unlikely to see much. But but if we if we see something that we don't see with some of the others, it would at least give us a sense that it might be accumulating. But yeah, yeah. If I may add a few comments, you know, I saw the 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 data, and there would be two comments that I would have. One is certainly it looks like the introduction or replacement of the hydroxyl group by the by an amine, whether it's a, an amine or a guanidine, does, seems to be detrimental to the overall IC15KI effects. Now, one other slight point is that uh, the number of significant figures here is probably excessive. I don't think that it quite adds to the Im impact. Yeah, realistically, let's yeah. cut that back. No, I um, yeah, I, that's 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 fair. Yeah, right. <clears throat> so um, atomized compounds. Um, we received um, two batches of compounds back in uh, twenty twenty three, um, and we screened all of these at a single concentration of 0.5 millimolar versus Mercy, Merdi, and Murray, which we were tasked to do. And I also, since we were at it, threw in Mer F, uh, simply because it seemed a little bit of a glaring omission, given that that um, there was a possibility that if they targeted the other three, they might target the fourth. Um, I presented the IC50 data uh, for Mer D and Mer E in uh, the previous uh, um, meetings we've had, um, and half of the data with Mercy. Um, so now I'm going to basically give you the rest of the data, uh, the, the rest of the IC50 data for um, pseudomonas Mercy with the atomized hits, and also the data for MRF, the IC50 data for MRF with the 
0.5 millimolar hits against that. So <clears throat> I'm not suggesting letting go through all of this now, but this is there for you to go through um, at your leisure. But we, we have all of the data uh, as IC50s with hill coefficients to give you some idea of uh, if there's anything untoward happening in the relationship between inhibition and compound concentration. Um, and also on the right hand side, you have the original hit data of 0.5 millimolar. Looking at the curves, this, now this is Mercy. For the most part, uh, well, first of all, all the hits at half millimolar basically translated into IC50s. Second general point is that the quality of the data is reasonably good. In fact, it's far better. Um, in terms of the shape of the curves compared to the data with Mer, Mer D and Mer E. Um, and you're not getting super potent compounds here. The best you're looking at is around about 15 micromolar as an IC50. But if, you, if we're thinking about these things as fragments, that is a starting point. So... Um, Basically, we've done all the IC50s against the Mercy hits, and I can progress through them. Um, basically, the IC50s do extend all the way up to around about 700 micromolar. When you do get to those really high concentrations, however, the scatter of the data does get worse and worse. Um, and we, we have, but we do have a complete data set now for Mercy. So if you look at what's going on, there appears to be a compound class, acylthiophenylacetamides, which are rather probably clumsily named. Um, but basically, um, the motif of um, what appears to be a peptide bond, uh, uh, beta to a thiol with something aromatic at the end, appears basically to be a really good hook for mercy. <laughs> And this is consistent as with what we've seen before. So with the previous atom-wise screening we've done back in 2022, this molecule uh, really, really, really stood out. Um, and again, it's the same general thing. You basically have a peptide bond with uh, a, a sulfur and methylene away and um, a heterocycle at the end of it. It's this class of molecule that, that uh, we've wondered about, I think, in the past, and we've worried about it because um, of the possibility of it being chemically reactive. Um, now, at the moment, I don't know whether it is. Um, we can do some time-dependent studies to see whether there's time-dependent loss of inhibition. We can do some mass spectrometry to see if we see any multiplication of the protein. We can do these things. Um, but that said, there is a spread of IC50s, which suggests that there is some sort of structure to the relationship, and I think it probably does merit further thought. I also quite like the simplicity of the um, the ones in the bottom middle, the acyl benzoxas also phonomines you've got there. I mean, yeah. one of them... Good, but the others are, you know, again, you get a spread and they are structurally very simple. Um, so, so yes, I mean, I agree with you that the main results are those, but those are also not worth, uh, also worth considering. Yeah, exactly. Um, and my next, my next practical move with these things um, is, is, from the enzymology point of view, is to basically look in more detail at the kinetics of inhibition um, and to see whether um, basically they do compete against ATP or the UDP substrate. Um, so that that's where we are. It, it is kind of gratifying that there are groups, not just one particular compound set. Um, it will be interesting to know, of course, whether these things are targeting the same site um, and again, that's my job really coming up in, in terms of trying to characterize the binding of these things in the enzymological sense, tying down the binding slide that they're actually targeting. 
You mentioned yeah. mass spec. Do you have a, a mass spec core that can can do covalent identification uh, of protein modification? Yeah, we, we 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 do have an instrument that's capable of actually doing doing that. But native native mass spec. Mm. Um, of course, I mean, <laughs> well, so if I carry on, the one the one one other thing about Mercy, by the way, that does stand out, and it's different from the other Merli gazes. So we we use a standard inhibitor, ADPCP. We've used it all the way throughout as an ATP analog, and it, it's a very effective inhibitor. Mercy is unique <clears throat> in the sense that its relationship between inhibition and ADPCP concentration is such that there are more than one binding event when you try and interpret the data. And this agrees with Laura's data in SPR, which indicates there's more than one binding event with ATP and ADPCP. And it also agrees with the fact that uh, you get substrate inhibition with Mercy against ATP, which means there has to be more than one binding mode for ATP. And going back, that might be the basis of why we're getting uh, a number of different chemical classes lighting up. Of course, we'd love a crystal structure that, that <laughs> underpins this, but, but it is something marked, something that is unique to Mercy, and it may be smoke and mirrors, and it may be um, uh, a coincidence, but it is interesting that Mercy has been, for example, the best in terms of quality and frequency of hits, and it may well be connected to the fact that there's more than one target on the site. Right. Oh, oh, sorry, one last thing. Um, Yuhang's compounds, they can be entirely represented by a single interaction, not two. So, MRF, um, we generated 12 hits at 0.5 millimolar in the initial atomized screen. Um, and at that point, we did the IC50 work. Again, the assay details are in the panel on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, we didn't generate any hits with, with IC50s less than around about um, 100 micromole. I think the best we've got is about 90 or so. Um, so there's no nothing particularly potent that stands out here. And if you look at the data, the data in general, again, they're rather like the data we were getting with mer D and mer E. In other words, you're seeing sigmodicity, sorry, I beg your pardon, in a, with a lot of the molecules. You're seeing fairly large error bars. Um, and it seems to me that you're possibly getting aggregation of the protein, perhaps. Um, simply because a lot of these molecules are perfectly fine with MERC themselves and give perfectly acceptable IC50s with perfectly acceptable curves. So um, I do wonder whether some of the noise we see here is more to do with the stability of the protein rather than necessarily the aggregation of the compound. I can't be sure, but that's what it would be suggested. So, again, for your edification and delight, here are the entire, this is the entire data set now um, of inhibitors, IC50s, and Hill coefficients um, against C, D, E, and F. Um, and we've always been interested in the idea that there's multi-targeting going on with this. So, uh, and also, clearly, you can see that MERS-C really, really is a sucker for these compounds compared to the other ligases. So if we go back to... I'll move you all out of the way for a second. Sorry about that. Right. If we go back to the original seven compounds that appeared at half millimolar to target all the ligases, which was at the time a very exciting result. And then we look at their IC50s now. Um, what basically really stands out is the 
in the right hand side, the red bar is Mercy, brown D, E is purple, and F is blue. If you look, the IC fifties are much, much lower for Mercy in general in in, in this multi-targeting set. Um, in many cases, extremely lower. Um, so it's it's fairly clear that this particular compound set is really selective for Mercy over and above the other ligases. So to use it as a launch pad for developing multi-target inhibitors, I my feeling is that might be a bit of an ask. Um, however, if we restrict ourselves to molecules that maybe target two or three or even one, and we say that we're going to be not interested in anything with an IC50 greater than 100 micromolar, um, OSA 1145 does triply target. Um, OSA 1155 doubly target C and F. OSA 1169 um, targets C and E. Um, and the remainder are uh, single targets for Mercy. Um, and that's really where we are at the moment. Just on the previous slide. Yeah. Um, I mean, just looking at the size of those curves, then I guess the two best are 1164 and 1155 as, you know, if you sort of averaged all of the curves, all of the, the histogram heights. Yeah. I forget what those are, but I need to... I need to dig those up because I mean that if they're part of the same series and again that lends way to perhaps those series being the most useful yeah so what 1164 and 1155 1155 let's have a look I just scroll back we can find them yeah well, they're on, there would have been that big so 1145 is top row uh, yeah. second to the left right and the other one was one one six four. One six four. Okay, second row, second to the left. Yeah. That's one of you ways. Yeah. Right. There you go. Great. Great. Thanks. I mean, yes, crystallography is just it still remains key, doesn't it? Yeah, um, it does. I mean, uh, we, you can do so much with this. Um, you can you can generate decent mode of action data. Uh, you can generate microbiology, but structure based drug discovery needs structures. I, mean, I don't want to belabor yeah. the obvious here, but um... yeah, yeah, it does. And I'm not sure that any other technique is really going to. Um help us you know so if you want to know where something's binding you can you can do the, the fancy hd exchange mass spec but and i don't think that would necessarily help us because we want to see how it's binding not where yeah um spr is is not going to tell us anything we don't already know i don't suspect because we're not using it as a screening tool you know we actually want structural information um Laura has been doing all this work on on trying to get crystals grown. Is there any value? I, I mean, I don't know what what the pipeline is like, but that's that's traditional crystallography, of course, because you have crystals or protein. Um, there's no point in trying cryo, presumably. Um, I don't think that will significantly change very much. And one thing that um that uh, Diamond and other beam lines now do is they do a lot of room temperature data collection because they can, because of the rapidity with which they can do this, um, right. basically alleviates a lot of radiation damage these days. Right. Um, so um, she has been exploring that. Um, the other thing that we've also been wondering is that. Um, the ability to do time-resolved crystallography um, is something that's really come to the fore in the past few years. So where you're actually 
able to collect data fast enough to catch intermediates along in, uh, uh, enzymatic pathways. Now, given that any MER ligase has to go through two, tra two transition states, the first being the formation of the ASL phosphate, the second being the tetrahedral intermediate you form with the amino acid. Um, one thing that we've been thinking about seriously is if, if we were able to do this type of thing with a MER ligase, we might get some decent information um, about transition states or things close to it, which might make our uh, design design of molecules a little bit more accurate for uh, what we want them to do. Right. Um, so I do, I do think that might be worthwhile. The, the other thing is that there are some transition state analogs out there for uh, C, MER, D, and MER E. So these are some of the older molecules made by AstraZeneca and um, we're looking into having them be synthesized to see whether we can use those as co-crystallization ligands as well, uh, to see what information that would give us. So those, those are the sort of longer term things that we're thinking about for, for Warwick at the moment. Um, in the nearer, uh, in the, in, uh, we, we do have, um, and apologies for not having done it yet. Now you're waiting for the data, but uh, your TB uh, Murray inhibitors are next, then, and they will come. I apologize for not having them now. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> um, it's ours to tame the and pairs of hands, I'm afraid, at the moment. Yep, and and the uh, and I, I guess the um, the original AZ compounds are, are still in the pipeline. Is that right, Adrian? The original AZ compounds. The ones that we were sent from AZ. Yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah. So, so yeah, Laura said she sent an email that said she'd been at Diamond and and had not managed to get any um, structures for anything that I think the only thing she saw um, was, let me just make sure I get the terminology right. Uh, she was there the other day, and yeah, I can't. I can't, I've got the email in a second. She only saw, I think, UMP bound, right? Yeah, that, that's my understanding. There was a, a frizzle of excitement a few weeks ago when um, what, what one of the our American collaborators did actually uh, manage to co-crystallize one of the enemy hits, um, and get it resolved in a crystal structure. The problem was, though, that it was fairly obvious that the molecule was binding between protomers in the crystal structure. So it oh, was right. binding as a function of there being a crystal lattice as opposed to actually binding in a discrete pocket. Okay. Right. Yeah, so UMA bound with MERDI. That, yeah. that was the only interaction with a smaller molecule issue, so I think. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So um, we don't have a crystallography update um, from Scott. He was on the invite, but I guess couldn't make it. But, uh, so I have to wait till next time to see if there's a, an update from them about what they've been doing. But all right. Thank you very much, Adrian, for all of that. You're welcome. Uh, the I mean, I, I think there is reason to believe that some of these structures will indeed be bound nicely to something, and <laughs> um, and and the the structural information just gives us a sense of how we can modify the structures. Yeah. That's all. That's why it's so. Cool. And we can, we can continue to play around with things without that, but it really is um, much slower if we don't have the structures. Yeah. Right. Shall I stop sharing them? Thanks. Be good. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Adrian. Right. Uh, may I may I have one question about the the the, the compounds I sent? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So basically, I was I I've been always worrying about the the method I prepare the concentration of compounds. Uh, uh may different uh may differ from you uh what you guys been carefully measuring. So like, uh, any chance we could uh, just have a, for example, some, uh, I use the pipette to. 
prepare uh, samples and measure the concentration. Uh, but I was wondering, like, what what kind of methods you guys were using? Uh, like, uh, for example, when I when I sense ac the actual solid compounds, uh, uh solid molecules, uh, to you guys, is there any uh, chance that I could potentially like uh, mess up with the concentration that caused the tenfold of uh, uh mismatch of expected <laughs> potencies? I right. think, I mean, I mean. I think it's unlikely. I mean, uh, it, it, I mean, a tenfold difference in potency requires a tenfold difference in weight if you're weighing things out. I mean, I, I don't. Yeah, it's, it's um, not. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's not likely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, is it? I don't know whether you know. Um, I mean, one thing that would be really useful would be an extinction coefficient for these things, because if there was such a thing, then it would be very, very easy to check. For example in a very rudimentary way that the concentrations that we were working with were the concentrations that we were supposed to be working with. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I would find it difficult to believe that it would be that easy to make such an error that you will be that <laughs> many sold out. Yeah. Um, yeah. When, you, when you're weighing stuff, it just doesn't really make yeah, sense. That's... Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, also, like the 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 WIH thirty uh, as the as the control compounds we sent this time for IC fifty. That was a remake. We previously have the MIC for that compound already. So, like, uh, if we could uh, get an MIC out of this uh, sec uh, uh, out of this compound again, then we can probably see. Oh, maybe maybe it's, maybe all the other compounds were actually not active according to this yeah i mean there was one thing that did occur to me when i was doing the experiments um because we're now dealing with free amines um um there is which and they will have a pka of presumably north of eight nine or something along those lines mm -hmm. um there may well be a ph dependence on the sensitivity of our uh, uh, mercy to these molecules, depending upon how important or cr critical it is to have a protonated amine or a uh, free amine. Um, do you think it's worthwhile repeating the IC50 data, let's say six or uh, nine or something like that? What, uh, was, it at, uh, what, what was it before? Uh, 7.6. Yeah. Is the I mean the protonation is relevant to the accumulation, not the not the enzyme. You're right, um, but we don't know that the protonation would be irrelevant as far as the enzyme is concerned. Yeah. Never know that yeah. for sure. Um, I mean, if, the, if that's feasible, that would be of course interesting. Um, yeah. If I mean, I, I think I guess the best control would be the active, which is the alcohol. Yeah. For sure, that would be an interesting thing to check. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, so the, the thing about that that change, which is interesting, is that um, if you just look at the uh, isolated structure of Mercy uh, as a as a single protein, um, uh, which has been crystallized, which, as I understand it, is truncated, um, you you see that this amine alcohol position is pointing to solvent, um, but if you add in the bit that was cut off there's a helix there that gets in the way. So I think that we we may be overestimating the amount of space that's available in that position for stuff. So the fact that as you put in big bulky groups like that, you're getting not fantastic results is not, is not totally surprising. Um, it's still been worth checking it. But I think that the, the still, I think the surprise for us is that, is that simple amine change giving not, not great results. Um, so, but so anything, so yeah, having a charge there without a big associated group would be useful, um, we think, because it should bind. But but the the test you're talking about of of checking it, um, a different pH would would be a really neat extra bit there. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we can do. It's um, it'll require configuring the assay. Yeah. It's not. Um, it just mean I'll have to sort of re 
reconsider and reevaluate the sensitivity of the assay at different pHs because, for example, the coupling system will uh, have altered characteristics with the parties fluorescence at different pHs. Yeah. So I'll we'll need to look into that. But in principle, it's certainly doable. Right. So, I mean, I would definitely put this down the priority list compared to the the AZ compounds and the and the TB compounds. Yeah. So it's not, I can't, can't justify your time, Adrian, on, on that, but it's certainly a very interesting one to do at some point. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you, Hank, did you want to say anything quickly about molecules that are in the, in the pipeline? Uh, uh, I can I can send afterwards. Okay, if you want to post yeah. that afterwards, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, it's okay. all uh, in the email chamber, like uh, our re uh, re uh, our extractive. Yeah, dump it on the yeah. on the GitHub issue. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, and uh, so I guess from the uh, any you colleagues, Sam and Bob, are you? Do you want to provide any updates or any thoughts? Yeah, I can give you a very quick um look at what we've done. That'd be give great. Me a moment. Yeah. Right. Um, so this is going to be very short. Um, we've had we've had two undergraduates working on the project. Um, so the synthesis is based on compounds. These were the two original hits or lead or original compounds that were of interest. Um, and these three compounds have been submitted. Um, it has been surprisingly slow going, especially with this tertiary amine. Um. Cut the scaffold here, which complicates a myriad of things um, in terms of synthesis and purification. Um, the, the basic synthesis route is this one. Um, and when we have tried, we can't follow, when we have a tertiary amine, we can't follow these reactions by LCMS. The compounds are so polar that they're just coming off in the solvent front. We've been enabled to, um, to really investigate or to optimize the, the conditions for these. When we have alkyl substituents, it's significantly more easy. So um, we're going to be looking on pressing forward with that. And in doing that, we also noticed, well, it was kind of a, a nice lesson in undergraduate chemistry. Um, when we tried this reaction with an aniline or a pyridine aniline derivative, um, we didn't see this desired product, but we saw the quaternary um, forming. So that was interesting. We haven't been able to find conditions to push that towards attacking from the XFIP nitrogen. Um, but we're still working towards that. It's still slow progress. Tommy, Tommy's here for three days a week at the moment. So hopefully we'll be able to push on a little bit. Um, and then, yes, yeah, so we have three compounds permitted. One of them does have this tertiary, that was a blog, but it does mean that we've got one of them in there to see if it significantly improves. We've shipped it to AstraZeneca for ADME properties. And we've also shipped it to Warwick for um, testing in Murdy. Um, so we can significantly we can see if it significantly improves Adamy and if it's worth trying to soldier on and find a better route towards these tertiary amine compounds. Um, and then at the moment, Tommy is going to be looking at finishing off compounds with a cyclohexyl derivative. There's been a few we postulate we're going to have a new undergrad joining at some point who will work on the dimethyl core but Tommy will focus on the cyclohexyl core. And we're postulating to start moving from left to right um, with these potential different analogs. Um, we had a bit of a discussion. These haven't been completely verified yet. We're, well, we're open to input, but um, that's kind of where we're at. We're, we're chugging along, but it's been slightly delayed, slightly slow progress. Right, the pyridinium on the previous slide, that's... That's a motif that Yu Hang's been looking at. The one at the bottom, right? The uh yeah. that's a motif that's also meant to help with accumulation, so not necessarily a terrible compound. <laughs> uh we are, we're welcome to, uh, we, we were wondering whether we should ship it or not. We are no, happy to um to ship it and send it to you. Why not? Send it to the Warwick. We we won't ship too many of them. <laughs> we'll just start with one and then we'll go from there. Um but yeah, no, so we can do that, we can sort that out. And yeah. Hopefully we'll have a few more compounds next time we present. 
Magic. Thank you. If I may add something with, with regard to that pyridinium salt, is that it, we could perhaps make it as the dihydropyridine, which would mean it would be a neutral compound, which may enhance uptake. And typically when intracellularly, uh, certainly with mammalian cells, possibly with the bacterial cells, that you could get the oxidation to the pyridinium, which may trap it. That's been a, uh, a drug delivery thing for uh, uh, for for drugs. Bodor um, in the U.S. has used that a lot. And so if you took that uh, pyridinium salt and, uh, or make it as the dihydropyridine, it'd be interesting to see if there's a difference between the two. Yeah, that sounds good, Bob. We can... Um... I'll look up see if see if we've got building block for that. We can um we can definitely we can investigate talk, it. We can talk about that tomorrow at the meeting. Perfect. Sounds good. Cool. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. If there's any way you can just dump that that those slides in the uh GitHub issue, that would be very helpful. Yes, yeah, we'll do. Yeah. All right. Um and uh Bart, I I I don't want to pick on you first thing in the morning. Um, and and Scott's not here to give an update. But anything you want to add, or should we just uh, interact with Scott? Say the number you want to send. I think we need to uh, pick it up with Scott because I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, yeah. sure what Scott's up to right now. Can you see? Oh, good. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Anybody else got any other business? I had one thing quickly, which was that uh, we finally finished our CC4 carb proposal for more chemistry on exploring some of the AZ structures. And um, we will be submitting that basically later today. Um, the idea is we get feedback from the organization and then it goes into a board meeting, which will be happening next month. So fingers crossed for that. Um, and several people have helped with various bits of that. And it's been a little bit slow going because we've been doing everything else at the same time, but we'll send that in ASAP. All right. Any other, any other business? Okay, great. If not, thanks very much for your time, everybody. Good to see everybody. And see you next time. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.